Okay. Hello, everyone. So, my name is Shimizu Kevin, and this is actually uh, my or like my first podcast on this channel. So, um, yeah, as you as you can see from my YouTube name, well, I'm a Japanologist, so like on my YouTube channel, I will will look for all kinds of issues in Japanese society. Especially like contemporary issues, like nowadays issues. However, because this is my first podcast, let's start with something very different. Let's start at the beginning of Japan. And I have an inter interesting guest for today uh, who can help us to understand more what happened in like medieval, medieval man, more like ancient Japan, I guess. So the guest I have today is uh, yeah. Let me introduce my guest. Uh, he is an anthropologist, and um, he's called Mr. Dossett. Mr. Dossett has uh, like a bachelor in anthropology and various uh, masters degrees. I'm not sure three or four. Uh, so yeah, Mr. Dossett, could you introduce yourself? Thank you, Mr. Simisu. Uh, my name is Roshi Dossett. Or Often people call me Ari Dossett. I'm an anthropologist. I did cultural anthropology and adult sociology, a dual bachelor at Leiden University. I, my first month was international relations with a track European Union studies, so focus on the, the EU. My second master, also at Leiden University, was Latin American studies. Wow. For that, I did field work in Guatemala, uh, uh, which was quite intense. Oh, and sounds, I also did a third sounds, master sounds. At, Ras at Rasmus University, Rotterdam, mm. uh, in sociology. Uh, focus on wow. migration policy. So that's me. So I guess, uh, like, like your knowledge is from like a like a very broad spectrum. I mean, from soci sociology to up to like anthropology and like even European studies. So that means also you have a lot of knowledge uh, about like the European law system, isn't it? Indeed. Mm. Uh, we went quite deep into it at the first master. But uh, besides that, I also have a lot of historical knowledge because as an anthropologist, you have to specialize yourself. So I focus on colonial history, but also on the history of human sexuality. And that's also how I uh, found the subject of the origin of Japan as a nation, mm. which is quite interesting, of which uh, you will induce the topic and we'll go into it. Yeah. And like uh, one thing I, I'd like to add for. Uh... Our viewers, like uh, Mr. Dossett is actually, uh, because I know Mr. Dossett for a, like for a very long time right now, um, even like in our early like like uh, well childhood, I guess uh, he was always like interested interested in like how people how people were like reacting and like interacting with each other, but also like in history, like like, like you could say like. Uh, like he, one of his biggest hobbies is like to study about history, all kinds of history. So that's why we're here today. And yeah, okay. So talking about the content, okay. So uh, today we're going to talk about like the early days of Japanese civilization, uh, especially. Uh, so we we would like to focus uh, 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 like to, about the shamanist queen Himiko, and probably a lot of Japanese is out there who've studied on university would probably never heard about this name like Queen Himiko like who the hell is she uh, so yeah so let's start with that Queen Himiko um, like so Queen Himiko like what I could find about Queen Himiko it, it was like uh, not so much just like especially the Japanese sources um, like don't even they don't even mention her. So most of the sources are from China. So um, okay, let's start when she was born. She was born uh, like between one seventy and two forty eight, and she reigned something. We're not sure what she was reigning because it's it's like pretty fake. Like she had a lot of people under her, but we. We're not sure like how much power she had, but she reigned from 189 to uh, 248. 
Uh, okay, so yeah. And that was, of course, during the Yayoi period. It started from 1000 before Christ uh, until 300, uh, like after the Um uh, So yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, Mr. Justin, if, 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 you, if, you, if you'd like to, to add anything, please. Uh, so uh, right. yeah, so the origin, like the origins of the first arrivals in Japan, are like like most of the information we get are from the sources from China, especially from the Kingdom of Wei, around two twenty mm -hmm. to sixty five. So the name Himiko, as mentioned in like the Book of Wei, which is a part of like uh, like all kinds of uh, like books and sources from ancient China um, mentioned that the name Himiko was uh, like like linked to the Queen of the Sun. Uh, Mr. Dusset, could you highlight on that? All right. Well, first thing first, when you, when you talk about the history of ancient Japan, yeah. always remember that Japan back then was not a country like it is today with the Japanese nation. Right. Yet various tribes. Exactly. The ancient Chinese sources mentioned that there were 100 communities. Later, it showed up to 50 communities, which all had direct trade mm -hmm. with uh, the, the Han Dynasty. And the Han Dynasty, similar to ancient Rome, they had a strong bureaucracy in which they documented what happened. Mm -hmm. And Let's say in the East, I mean Asia, it was the Han Dynasty, which was the stable factor for centuries. Mm. In the West, it was Rome. Now, Rome was more powerful than the Han Dynasty, because Rome even had trade all the way to Asia. And I believe there were also Roman coins found near Kyushu uh, recently. So what I'm going to point out is that the Han Dynasty was the stable factor. So when the Han Dynasty records about this shaman queen, it's yeah. something we need to take as credible because the because in Chinese culture, a dynasty only has a right to govern if they have the mandate of, of heaven. That simply means that the dynasty must prove to be trustworthy and effective for the public. So there is no interest for the ancient Chinese bureaucrats to lie or to invent things about a region of islands that was relevant for trade. Because at the time, the Han Dynasty had commanderies, those military settlements in the north of Korea. Mm, yeah, that was... So trade with Korea was, was important, as well as trade with the region called Wa, which today we call Japan. Yeah, that would be so common sense, So the Chinese right? sources mm. are... Yeah, indeed, it's common sense. The Chinese sources are therefore very similar reliable. The Japanese sources, um, the they don't even right. mention mm. Himiko. And here's one thing you need to understand also. Himiko had dealings with uh, the Kingdom of Wa. For those who don't know about Chinese history that much, let me give a very brief summary. The Han Dynasty began to decline. And it, the Han Dynasty had one of the biggest navies in ancient times. At some point, it employed around 200,000 people. But the Han Dynasty declined. There were a lot of revolts, uh, especially farmer revolts. You had the Yellow Turban Revolt also, I believe, uh, in the 18... Uh, no, no, we do not. I'm sorry, the, the seven, one of the years, 170 or something like that. But anyway, you had many farmer revolts. This exhausted the Chinese Empire or the Han Dynasty. So also trade suffered. And in the year 189, the year that Himiko began her reign, the Han Dynasty collapsed. And there was an enormous massacre in the capital of the Han Dynasty. Now, officially, historians say that the three kingdom spirit of China, in which the Han Dynasty fell apart in three empires, in which Wei was one of them, right. it, this had happened in 220. But from, from, from 189 to 220, there was, it was an era of chaos and decline. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's also a bit suspicious that the same year, that there is this governmental collapse of the Han Dynasty, which was perceived as the source of ability in Asia, that's the same year you have this shaman queen, a woman, taking on 
the throne and uniting several kingdoms. Yeah. Like, so uh, like, often people I, I don't look she, at the context. She, yeah, she brought she brought like uh, like thirty IOE kingdoms or communities together, and the way how she did it was by using like magic and spiritual spells because actually they they call they she was called Queen Himiko but also like an shaman priestess. So that's also not to forget like it it like the things we're talking right now are getting pretty dark like uh, when you talk about like uh, princess of darkness and stuff like that well you know what they you know you probably should know what they did um, if they were like like doing those like demonic kind of stuff like what kind of rituals they would do as well so yeah yeah yes and one thing to remember is that in the modern era we perceive uh, spiritual practices as religious. Religion is an organ, is an institutionalized, um, is an is, is, is institution that regulates people's thoughts and behaviors. That's what religion is. Yes. Now, the state, the government does a similar thing, but it's more focused on the practical things of daily life, like r- arranging resources and services. So that distinction we have today, we call it the separation of church and state, is something from the West. In ancient times, this did not exist. That means the spiritual practices were not considered religion. I want to say that a, a, a part of daily life and the religion and state were almost the same thing. Yeah, so, well, well, to be honest, we, we you, can still see it nowadays. They're saying that like, uh, state and religion are separated, even in Japan. However, all their um, like public holidays, well, 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 80% of the public holidays are like, Originally, um, came originally from like, like re- religious events or like religious rituals. So yeah, and it's the same yes. for the West as well. So yeah, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yes, because because one thing to understand is that religion has its root in rel- religio. Oh no, no, rel- religare is an is a Latin term means to bind again. So religion. Is a belief system that's institutionalized, so it's established by a community to regulate the beliefs of the public. The state or the government is an is an organization that claims the right to regulate the resource and relationship within an area. So what they do is is a bit similar. And for a people to recognize a government, they must believe in the legitimacy of the government. So there you see religion and state. Even though in the Western concept they're separate, in daily life they kind of overlap one another. And spirituality are just the actual spiritual uh, practices like uh, blood sacrifices or church attendance, all this other stuff people do. So spirituality and religion are not the same thing. I just want to point it out to you. And exactly. what, when you talk about um, class, classical Japan or ancient Japan, understand you had kingdoms. But the kingdoms back then were not what we consider kingdoms today with a written constitution, a parliament, all of that. Let, let me just give a, a, a little illustration how those kingdoms were because it's, it's, it's a bit similar all over, all over the world in ancient times. Mm. You had a household which were led by what we consider a chieftain. A chieftain was the, was the man with the most ec- ec- economic ambition. And mm. then you had other families that went in line with this primary family. And the area in which this primary family uh, governed was called a chiefdom, and if the chiefdom was more advanced, it, be, it was called a kingdom. Well, that's what you had in Japan. So you had yes. uh, around, you had like 50 communities, according to the records, the Chinese records, but doesn't mean that every community had its own king. Some kingdoms consist of multiple communities. So you had over around 30 kingdoms, you had, mm. and they all were operating independently of one another. And they were also often in conflict with one another. So there was no Japanese consciousness or whatever. And there was no uh, proposed homogeneity. Like a lot of people say Japan is homogenous today. <laughs> well, they didn't even exist then because you had a lot of migrants from Korea. It, it was in. all over the place, right? You also had yes, like the Ainu in the north, like which most people yes. still like forget. Oh, yeah, wait, we, we also have Ainu, like uh, like indig- indigenous group. Yes. Hmm. And the history of um, the tribal kingdoms of Japan is centered mostly in what we call the south of Japan. So that excludes the Ainu region, which yep. 
kind of begins exactly. in the north of the Q, uh, Honshu uh, Islands. Ta- ta- so talking about lo- the Aino kind of ta- talking about location, um, because there is like a big discussion also among histories, like uh, historians. I mean, about like uh, where uh, like the like the community or like the kingdom of uh, Queen Himiko was. Like uh, most would, be, would would suggest near Kyushu, while others are suggesting around the area of Kansai, which is like Osaka Nara. Uh, what do you think about that? All right, I looked into it myself. Mm-hmm. Both check what the Japanese source was saying about it, and one thing I found interesting is mm-hmm. that yet this uh, emperor of Japan. Well, here's the thing: the title emperor or Tenno was posthumously to this individual, so the individual was not called an emperor during his lifetime. Okay, so that's something the Japanese, uh, I believe, the sources called the Kojiki and Nihon Shoki. Yes, they often did this, to put, uh, ascribing the title emperor to people that lived in the past, even though during the lifetime the title emperor was even known to them. So yeah, you had this yeah. individual, which they call Keiko. Oh, well, he's real. He had, he had a very long name. I'm not going to even try to pronounce that one over here. But this individual was, as you can see, he was a tribe. Uh, he was a king that lived in the area of Nara, and he sent one of his sons to the uh, area of Kyushu to take it over to expand himself. Hmm. And when you look at the uh, the Kiki, as they call it, the the, the Ko, Kojiki and Niun Choki, it all centers around Nara. And historians mm-hmm. have confirmed in Nara you had an advanced uh, economy for that time. But like then the, the, you also the had big central point, right? Like where the big rulers yeah, were. This... Yes. Mm-hmm. Now there were other uh, kingdoms around, but the one in Nara was the most dominant one. And don't forget when the Empire of Japan or Nippon was established later, I believe in the around the year six hundred, uh, the capital went. N- from Nara to what we today call Kyoto, which is also in the same region. So it is clear that mm. Nara yeah. was an economic center in ancient times, but Kyushu was also relevant because, remember, the Han Dynasty was the main economic power in Asia. Mm. It was not the world power that was Rome, but the regional power was the Han Dynasty. And if you have ships and you leave from the Chinese harbors, where's the first place you arrive? Kyushu, of course. So Kyushu was relevant for trade. You have a lot of Chinese traders over there, even Chinese migrants going in and out. So that's why a lot of people say, well, uh, Queen Himiko must have been in Kyushu. But when you, when you look at the context, and I'm talking as an anthropologist, it wouldn't add up for to be a confederacy of kingdoms and it's run from Kyushu, mm. which was quite vulnerable for foreign invasions. or And also, the area of Nara, from there yet wrote going throughout what we today call Japan, and from there it's also easier to sail towards Kyushu. So Nara is more logical as, an, as a center. Now, what we can get out of this is that the area of Kyushu was economically relevant, absolutely, but Nara was the political center. So, that, so, it's, so that's why when you talk about this Queen Himiko, or whatever her real name was, because Himiko is also a translation from Chinese, hmm. Kyushu was the, was the place where they traded with other places like uh, Korea, ancient the Korean king, kingdoms, because Korea as a nation not existed, Korean kingdoms here and exactly there. Right. And also yeah. with, the, or with the Chinese Empire, or maybe if, even uh, nations in Southeast Asia, because it was also trade with that. And maybe even trade with the, the Romans, because the Romans went all the way to what they call Vietnam for, for trade. So Kyushu was the place where all the foreign trade would actually be arranged. Place to but be. it doesn't mean yeah. that the, the political center is there. Mm. Yeah, I mean, so it was in Nara, that's for sure. I'm not saying that there's no possibility that Himiko also had a second residence near Kyushu. Exactly. That like, likely was the case, but we know what, for sure what, she was in Nara. Uh, what I, I would suggest is like her, like her like community or like, uh, uh, like her kingdom was like established in Nara. Uh, I mean, in Kyushu, and that's that they then, like, once they had, like, all the power that they moved to Nara, because, like, once they had all the kingdoms, like, like, uh, 
tight together, she became like a big figure in Nara. That's what I'm thinking. But yeah, yes. I'm, I'm not sure about that. But yeah, but because we don't have the source, well, we don't have the sources. So yeah, it's it's just like thinking. Yeah, you know. So okay, L let me uh, go into what you just said. Just let's reconstruct the situation for a bit because this is something historians also anthropologists tend to do. We need to reconstruct a, 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 a situation. You had the area of Kyushu, where you had a lot of trade, and you had Nara, which was the main uh, in political center with also a strong economy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if let's say, because think about it, the Han Dynasty was in decline, and according to Chinese uh, sources, there was also. Uh, one of the kings of one of those kingdoms in Wa, which we know is the island region of Japan, one yes. of the kings over there was dumped over all the other kingdoms. It does mean that, they, that this king actually was the head of all the other kingdoms or the whole area, but the Chinese source mentioned was, was a king of one of the kingdoms. It doesn't mention which kingdom. Hmm. Now, based on knowing that Nara, the area of Nara had the, the political center, we have a right to assume that it meant the king of, the, of Nara, of that kingdom over there. Yeah. It said that there was a king, and uh, he died, or I say he, when he um, he died or whatever happened, and there was there was civil war for like seventy years. It said, and after that, a woman, by the use of black magic, took right. over yeah. uh, the whole area, Shaman, not just Shamanism, that one kingdom, yeah. but all the other areas. So when you look at this part, you have to conclude that okay, so the Chinese they traded with all the communities in ancient Japan, but they all but based on hierarchy, there was one of the kings that they had the primary dealing with. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean if we look at the so, at the sources of the Book of Wei, like they really described Himoko as like a powerful uh like yeah like a leader or like a queen. Because she had like a thousands thousand women and like hundred securities and, and also like one surfer. And like all those, all those like security guys or like even women were guarded like around the place where she was like being in seclusion to uh, gain access to the spiritual world. So yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and also understand, ancient Japan already had a religious sites here here and there, but it was loose worship. You can in a sense that yet one tribe uh, containing. For uh, being part of one king and worshiping a certain deities, an untribe does another one. Of course, you also had the Chinese deities over there. Uh, you also had Koreans that came in as Mayans bringing in deities also. So religiously, it was a bit, uh, I would say, pluriform. So there wasn't one actual religion they had. So think about it. If you want, if you have over twenty, if you have twenty-nine kingdoms, okay, and they all spread over a large area, because. It, because um, back then, you had to travel by horse, chariot, and some people even claimed that one of the many horses in Japan. So, in any way, to travel around uh, would take a while. You get know I me? Mean? Mm. To go from Kyushu to the Nara region uh, area, you can take a ship within just four days, three to four days, ready from Kyushu all the way to the area of Na Nara, where all, today also have Osaka. Mm. If you go by land from um, where we have. Uh, Today Hiroshima to Nara, it may take uh, maybe ten days. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So travel was a bit slow. If you want to unify people living in yeah, such an area slow. that's logistically difficult to maintain, you have to have a common religion. You know what I mean? Because you can't have everyone worshiping their own deities, but they all form a unit. Unit. So yeah. Himiko became the big, the religious figure that unified all those people. Oh, and because the uh, political center was in Nara. It's also around Nara that cultivation of rice uh, boomed. I'm not saying there was no rice cultivation before. There was, now, and, but and, under and, Himiko, the rice cultivation emerged yeah. uh, throughout the area. And now, and now you and now because, like as you mentioned, because of her, like all the communities get they got one and they formed one religion because they they, they saw Himiko as a, like. A, yeah, not like as a queen anymore, but like more as a de deity. Uh, so yeah, mm. like, and then when it comes to deity, uh, like the Nihon Shiki and like the Kojiki, guess what? Like, 
chemical was seen as the emperors of the sun, right? Like some, some mm-hmm. considered the Chinese sources probably considered it as well. But lay, later in the Kojigi, uh, the closest thing that is described to Himiko is like the deity Amaterasu, which is which is mm-hmm. which is the sun goddess, the goddess of the sun, right? Yes. Hmm. So uh, look at so, this. Uh, like, how did they? Yeah. So how? So my my question would be, how did they? Like the people who wrote the Kojigi, how did they came up with this deity? Yes. Do, do you see, see what I'm getting? Yeah. Yes. Uh, let me explain one thing to you also what often happened in human history. It goes like this. Let's say that there is an, a time, let's say, for example, uh, you have Greeks uh, from, uh, from the Greek city-states moving to what they call Italy, and they establish this town over there called Roma. Okay. But the foundation of that uh, settlement was quite violent and embarrassing. Later, you had several chiefs that became kings over there. You had the Kingdom of Rome. Later, they abolished the Roman Republic. And then Roman Republic became Roman Empire. So now, during the empire, uh, in ancient times, they wanted to deify the foundation of Rome. So the whole myth of, you know, there was yet Romans, uh, Ro- Romus and Romulus, two, a twin brother raised by wolves. And later, one killed the other and established the city uh, of Rome. Now, t- to a twin baby raised by wolves, I'm sorry, but that is quite unlikely. So why did they pass on this story? They pass on the story to hide the fact that there was a lot of uh, homicide amongst the Greek settlers. And to hide the fact that the foundation of Rome was quite violent. Mm. So that's how it works with mythology. You always hide something embarrassing that you cannot justify. Yeah. Now just think about this, about this um, about this deity, Amaterasu. Amaterasu, when you look at the mythology, she was seen as a goddess that uh, boosted the economy of Japan and unified mm-hmm. the nation by making sure the rice was uh, abundant and also textile increased under her. Now think about it. Yeah, it reminds Ooh, me of someone. Also traded, yeah, right? Yeah, Himiko traded with China directly, even as an individual, not just not just as a na- as a head of a nation, also as an individual. I, you get me sending I, tribute and all. Yes, that. and yeah, so and, and she, like she was sending tribute, and she also received a lot of uh, like yeah, uh, you know, important stuff back from from the Wei dynasty. So yeah. yes, and let me let me tell you, you don't get anything back from an ancient emperor unless you are relevant. So that shows you she was quite relevant. And look at this. Since the time of Himiko, after Himiko died in 248, you had another, I believe you had what you call the Kofun period beginning in Japan. They consider around 250. And so the Kofun uh, area was a bit more economically advanced. Because it was more rice cultivation, you had bigger mm. towns over there, you had better trade. So yeah. what we can see is, is that under Himiko, there was unity was generated amongst the public, amongst the kingdoms. The kingdom still existed because uh, Yamatai Koku, or what later was renamed Yamato, was a confederacy, mm. not a federation. Was Yamatai, a confederacy. yes. But still, yeah. But still, there was a boom in rice cultivation. The agriculture uh, boomed, and because agriculture boomed, also the trade in textile, uh, also because textile was quite important back then in trade. So, so yeah, you could understand. When you look at yeah, you... Amaterasu. Mm. And Himiko, you can see they're talking about Himiko over there. Exactly, right? That's what I would assume. And you could you yeah. could also consider that everything went that well that the people were happy with her. And of course, like they probably were like uh like giving praise to her. Like uh, see yeah, like seeing her as a deity such as Amaterasu or yeah, mm. as how the Kujiki that mentioned, and like by the way yes. about uh, how about like uh, like male and female status in ancient Japan? Because I I like I found some like um, like like some sources mentioning like grace grapes back in the Yayoi period, uh, like with like well arch archaeological like women skeletons with like 
all kinds of war like warrior arms and stuff so like people considered that female females back then had an like an elite role in in the in those like uh, communities or like kingdoms but then the question is what well what 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 were the men doing okay mm. well and let, 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 let's let's go back to the area okay? yeah the Chinese sources say that it was a, se- a period of 70 years. Now, 70 years is two and a half generation. Mm. Mrs. Shimizu, two and a half generation. Yeah. Okay? My age is 31 now. Okay? So, twice my age. You get know I me? Mean? Almost. That was the area that was civil war amongst those kingdoms. So, there was unease. Now, when you have so, so much conflict, at some point, the women get involved too. Mm. You get know I me? Mean? So, and also understand that uh, the role of the female, we, there was no feminism back then uh, uh, wanting to promote women to be equal to men. The woman was perceived as having her own function in daily life, and only when it comes to religious issues or spiritual issues could the woman ascend and have a leading, posi- a leading role as a priestess mm. or as a soothsayer. Yeah. But in daily life, women were considered, uh, I won't say as property, but they were considered as Submit submitted to the leadership of the men. They were, they were, However, yeah, they were actually like leading the agriculture sector back then uh, in uh, Yamata. Yes. yes, but here's the issue. Oh, I want to pull, come on, come to you. Mm. In an area like that, with the diverse kingdoms and all this conflict, um, just imagine this: agriculture, as we know, on the Himiko, it boomed. Himiko was a female; it was not a male figure. So, who would that inspire? Other women. So, and Himiko, according to source, had thousands because in ancient times, if something was in the thousands, but you didn't know how many thousands it was, it could be 2,000 per hundred or 8,000 so many. You don't know, you just say 1,000. You always had this tradition in the West in ancient times. So, Himiko had thousands of women attending to her, and only one man, another source is two men that actually had contact with her to the outside world. So, it's, yeah, so so like the the sources are saying. Like around a, a, a thousand, but like this is like a trick they do, like in all kinds of like very a- ancient sources. Like a, a thousand yes. doesn't mean like literally a thousand, it could be like thousands. So, yeah, yeah, yes. So, please, for all these, so, that, yeah, let me clear that out. Okay, go ahead. And let me tell you, and also in the source, it says that she lived in, in an area with towers around her. Towers. Mm-hmm. A, a tower back then, you didn't just build a tower. A tower was meant for military purposes. So she was military guarded. So that's how important she was. Mm-hmm. And you have thousands of women sounds, serving sounds within, like the, for- within, within the area. Sounds like a fortress. Yes. Mm. Yes, it was a fortress. So she wow. had all those women there, and no men who could, could just come close. Well, only two men. We can say they were allowed to come close to her, so no men were around, uh, allowed. Yeah, I mean the Chinese, so, like the the Chinese people uh, who came, they didn't they didn't have like directly a- access to Himiko. It was like through yes. people, through other people through servants and stuff. Yes. So, so having a woman so powerful, and remember, you still had the 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 tribal kings, the tribal kingdoms were still there. They still had their own uh, royal houses, their own local laws, all of that. But above all those male kings, you had a female um, ruler, in this case, a sun empress or a shaman queen. And with all those women serving her, that would have been a status symbol. That would have been something women would look up to, want to be like. So let's say you lived, for example, in an area in Kyushu. And in that local kingdom in Kyushu, uh, they were kind of a bit oppressive towards females. Mm-hmm. You could, you as a woman could remind them, hold on a minute, the one that runs us is a woman. And she has many women uh, administering onto her. Right? So it was not, mm. it did not become feasible anymore to say to the woman, sorry, but this is your role, you can't do anything more. If the one that runs you militarily and economically and financially is a woman herself. And here's the thing, Himiko was not married and she had no, no. men in her life. No, she couldn't. She couldn't get wow. married because she was like a priest, priestess. So that's the rule. Himiko, all, Himiko also motivated women to become more active in the economy. So it this, mm. so that's why it shouldn't be surprising yeah. that 
So we have archaeological evidence that there were women even wearing, uh, wearing arms. Exactly, right? Yeah. You get me? Yeah. Uh, 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 so, so that's, and also when you have a, a power vacuum, because remember, if, there's, if there was 70 years of unrest, at some point, some people take matters in their own hands, including females. You know? Yeah. So, women being active in agriculture and also in economy, but when it comes to textile, many of the textile producers were women. So, if textile became one of the main products of ancient Japan, guess who becomes more relevant then? The women are. Because they're the ones making the, the, uh, producing producing it. the yeah. textile. Yes. And also, right. when it comes to agriculture, uh, where it gives birth to the babies also? The women, right? Men can't can give birth. So, <laughs> and the population increased. So, women became more and more important under Himiko's uh, rule. Yeah, that, that's, that's still reality. Like, uh, men can give birth. That's reality. You're born as a female. Yes. And there's no you can give birth. <laughs> let, 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 uh, let you know there are those who try to doubt that today, but we hold up to the biological science over here. Yeah. But continue, Mr. Shimizu. Just, yeah. I mean, even the same, like the science is saying that. So, yeah. But, uh, yeah. So, let, so let, let me change. Let me change. So, like, we're talking about Himiko all the time right now. So, let me, let, Let's have a look at the Nihonshiki and uh, Kojiki, right? So there is mm -hmm. a, a similar, like, person, character, deity mm -hmm. in, in the Japanese sources. And her name, well, I don't know what, I, well, her, na her birth name was Okinaga Tarashi, but uh, she's called Empress Jingu. And the thing with Empress Jingu mm -hmm. is, um, well, she was born in 169 AD until 269. Guess what? Himiko was born around 170 to 48, so at the same time. She ran from... No, she was born... One... Yeah, she was born 170 and she died 248, so the... the... Yeah, yeah. And by the way, even from Empress Jingu, it's not clear where it was 169 was the time frame. So she was born at the same time as Himiko. Yeah, let's go, let's go to there. Yeah. Because that's true. They're, they're, like her reign is from 2 1 to 269, and yet they're not sure about that. Because why? What happened? Um, she was the wife of Emperor Chuhai, right? So, the, mm -hmm. so and she was empress from, 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 30 year, from 32 years up to 99 years old. Um, so, like, Emperor Chuhai uh, went to war with uh, Sila. Of, uh, we went to Sila in, like, it was, it was, like, one of the kingdoms in, in like, ancient Korea. He died. Jingu uh, took revenge and won the war and became empress. Uh, so, from the Korean sources, some, some good sagi, it says they contrib contribute her by the kingdom. Uh, uh, she... Like she was contributed by the kingdom of Pakche in the war against Shira. However, uh, like like war-related stuff, if you look further in the sources, that actually happened. Like when Japan really had conflicts with Korea was like in like in the late fourth century. So there is already here we have something like white. So she went she went to war with like Shira. But mm -hmm. wait a minute, her reign was between like two, like like the first, like first, like first second century. So there is something wrong already. Mm -hmm. What 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 do you no. what do you think? Okay. Mm. So as I mentioned before, when we talk about the emperors of Japan before the year six hundred or well. For the yeah, the first confirmed emperor, those were historical figures that were tribal kings from the Nara region. Because when you look at the, those emperors, or let's say those kings, better said, because the title emperor did not they, they didn't use it back then, they were all from Nara. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So and remember, uh, Himiko was the head of the confederacy. Okay, it's like the regional kingdoms, regional tiny uh, counties down there. So. What happens is that in the two Japanese sources of the ancient times, they mention the history of the kingdom of Nara as if it's the history of the whole region of Japan. 
Yeah, like you know I mean? yeah, there, there so, is a part like in the second formula of the Pujiki uh, or Nakatsumaki. Uh, it states that the Korean kingdom of Bache, of Bache, paid tribute to Japan under the tribute from Korea. While the Nihonshi states that Jin conquered a region in southern Korea in the third century, and 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 name, named it Nimana. Nimana. That's like mm-hmm. third century, though, but. Okay. Like, so, like, yeah. I understand. I understand uh, what uh, that people say this can't be true or whatever. Well, now l- l- let's look at this differently. Korea was not one nation yet. Back, back, Che, Shila, Gaia. Mm-hmm. Gaia was also Confederacy in itself. Uh, you had the uh, Okio king, uh, Kingdom also up there. And also you had the uh, Chinese military base in the far north also. So yeah, the Koreans yeah, like, were not united. Like, uh, what's this called? What was the name of that island? Like, uh, between uh, Korea and uh, Kyushu. I um, the name, but... Uh, I uh, believe in, in ancient times it was called Jindo. Yeah, Jindo. Tsushima, I, I believe it's called yeah. today. What was it called, to, what's it called today? Today, it's called Tsushima. Uh, it's called yeah, yeah. Today. Back then, it was Jindo. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Not Tsushima. Okay. So, and and think about it. Um, so let's say now about this em- empress. Uh, what's her name again? Let me check. Uh, Jing. A Jing. Okay. Yeah, Jingi. Oh, Jingi. Yeah. O- let's o- talk o- about. Kinaga Tarashi, but uh, yeah. Well, yeah. she's already dead. So they call Jingu. her Jingu. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go like that. Um. Let me talk about her. She came from the Nara kingdom, or whatever that kingdom was called. Mm-hmm. And it says here that she did similar things to Himiko. Okay? Right. And yeah. it said she invaded the promised land, which you assume is Korea also. Mm-hmm. Now think about it. Um, yeah, that's what if you have an, if you have a new co- a new con- if you have a confederacy, which is a new country, uh, you have to prove that a, that the new regime is worth it. Because don't think that just because she had a woman in charge, everything was sweet. You still had taxes to be paid. You still had what we call slavery happening back then. Um, and you also have the, you were known such thing as human rights. So blood sacrifices and uh, all of that also took place also. Yeah. So, I, yeah, so it wouldn't surprise What me. you're mentioning right now. So the main issue with the whole invasion s- scenario is a lack of remaining evidence. Of Jingu's ru- yes. ru- ruin Korea, had she, had she like yeah. any ruin Korea? No, okay, mm. yeah, okay, but I don't actually think she actually ran Korea because same here, yeah, uh, yeah. Korea was Korea had several king, had several kingdoms, and the kingdoms were far more stable than the kingdoms of uh, Japan back then. But the, the uh, because the advantage is is that uh, uh, Yamataikoku or Yamato was an island region, okay, yeah. and if if let I, it can possibly be that uh, this Jingu was actually one of the uh, partners or servants of Himiko that actually uh, went out and did a raid in uh, in mainland Korea. Now, not an invasion. An invasion literally means you come with the whole military with the purpose to take over. But it's possible that a raid took place based on some. Um, economic um some trade dispute because today you have treaties and you have courthouses that, that deal with trade you didn't have it back then so let's say now that um from uh yamato mm-hmm. or yamatai you that they ship some textile to uh one to the kingdom of shila but let's say now that the people in shila didn't pay uh the the, 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 the right amount who are you going to you can't go to the chinese emperor because china itself was uh, in a horrible situ- scenario back then. So what do you do? You can't go to the other Korean kingdoms because they will say, well, it's nothing to do with us. So you have to, you have to go after it yourself. So there mm-hmm. might have been a raid of several raids and maybe several occupation of coastal towns, yeah. but it doesn't mean that she actually took over Sheila and governed it. But it wouldn't surprise me if there was were actually a temporary occupation of coast, coastal areas just to... Oh, yeah. I, um, I... Uh, such, such a nice mm, yeah, I, I found something interesting about, like, interesting you. Like, so, uh, yeah, people like uh, even his histor- his like historian historian would think like there is something misleading over here. Uh, 
Um, however, according to the book from Pakche, Korea, uh, to the origin of Yamato, well, Japan, the Japanese had misinterpreted uh, from like the Guan, I don't even know how to say that, Guan Gaito, Steel, Steel, the Steel was a tribute mm-hmm. to a Korean king, but because of a lack of correct punctuation, the writing can be translated in four different ways. This same steel can also be interpreted as saying Korea crossed the strait and forced Japan into subjugation, depending on where the sentence is punctuated. An investigation done by the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences in 2006 suggested that the inscription could also be interpreted as Sila and Bakye were dependent states of Yamato, Japan. So, there okay. is... So there's your problem, like uh, translation, like old, yes. old, old, and also- old, old Korean sources. Translation isn't like, like yeah, they have like modern people have problems with translating things from the past. Mm. Yes, and let's take the scenario in which Pakche, which they call Kadura in Japanese, and Chila, um, because uh, Pakche was a, a rich kingdom. It was located in the southwest of the Korean Peninsula. It used to go all the way from the Han River, but later, uh, Korkyo from north took over the Han River Korkyo, area. Yeah. So, Baekje, um there are also sources that say that after uh, around the, the year 300 uh, in the 4th century, hmm. uh, for those that don't know, uh, uh, the year 300 to 399 is the 4th century. Uh, that's how we calculate it. So, it's not the 3rd century. No. So, yeah. there are sources saying in the 4th century that the Kingdom of Baekje had an economic boom expanding all over Asia, even establishing certain settlements, like colonies everywhere. Uh, mm-hmm. you, you get me? And so, there, so Baekje later became dominant over the area of Japan economically, that means after the, the life of Himiko. You get me? Yes. But, um, but, think, but think about it. Let's go back to the, the narrative of Jingu. Now, it's possible that Jingu is just uh, Himiko, but they try to uh, mythify her by saying that oh, she was the, em- the, 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 the wife of an emperor. Yeah. Even though in reality, like, uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's... Himiko was written that she had no men and she had no children. Yeah, because like, let's take some sources from the Korean Samguk, uh, Samguk Sagi. Like, she, she was, she reigned, she reigned, um, in the period around like 200, but like the like as I already mentioned, the Korean conflicts happened around like what you what you were tra- what you also mentioned like when um uh, what was it Pakche, like the Korean Peninsula became like like very strong like had a very strong influence like th- th- throughout the region in the fourth century. Yes, and. Yes. Conflicts uh, also like conflicts mostly happen during that time because yeah, because of that influence. Yes. Uh, yes. But this thing. Uh, okay. Good. Jingu reigned from 192 to 200, so not in the year 300. But yeah, true. But here's, here's the thing uh, with this. Pe- uh, Pekche's uh, boom happened far after uh, Himiko's um, time period, mm. but okay. Let's go back to the year 200. And the year 200 was like 11 years that Himiko was uh, actually on the throne. At that time, remember, the Han Dynasty was still on paper existing, but rather had uh, different fractions. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So what happens when there's civil war in an empire? People tend to get that have more criminality. There's something that uh, yeah. the Han Dynasty had a lot of trouble with. Of and also, think about the Korean kingdoms. They had a rivalry with one another. So there was no one Korean ruler back then, and because they all uh, were competing all the time, yeah, there was still there some all military conflict just, between them. Just like in Japan, but we're like all separated uh, yes. groups, communities, or kingdoms, yes. whatever. Hmm. But then you have a new economic uh, power rising, which is Yamatai or Yamato. So Japan, that used to be this area with uh, right? fighting yeah, yeah, tribal yeah. kingdoms, now became this uh, regional economic unit. So it would have been, I'm not saying it happened, 
but you can theorize that it would have been more uh, attractive for uh, Pekche and Sheila to not become part of uh, uh, Yamatai because they were quite tribal and local, but to be, to be part of an alliance with them. Mm-hmm. So I think that's where the, you get the story from that Jingu uh, kind of took over, uh, well, invaded Korea and took over parts of it. Because think about it. Um, when the Empire of Japan was established, yet a lot of Korean nobles from uh, Baekje, was Baekje collapsed at the time Japan was established, um, they moved to, um, to Japan. They moved to Yamato. And they were the ones that also helped establish in Japan. And this is something a lot of Japanese nationalists want to hear, but listen, many of the Japanese nobles were from Korean uh, origin. You know what I mean? Yep. Even the previous Japanese emperor uh, said he had Korean roots. Nope, not, not, you know I mean? not homogenous, homogenous, homogenous society. It's like all over the place. And, uh, and understand that um, and understand that the Koreans from Baekje had a lot of economic power still, even though they were in decline, they still had economic power. So what I want to put out is that when they established the uh, Empire of Japan and they began to write down the history of the new empire they established, it went from a confederacy to an empire. So as an empire, it's more like a, a federation now, in the sense of a loose confederacy. You get me? Uh, so a confederacy yeah. is when you have a bunch of nations joining forces on a military and economic level. That's a confederacy. Mm. A federation is when all of them are part of one uh, giant structure. You get me? So by reforming Yamato to Nippon or Nihon, now they have to justify this empire. So what you do then is that the history of the main uh, Japanese kingdom around Nara, you take that one, which was the most prominent one, and then you rewrite it, saying they were all emperors. And then you have you can't mention Himiko, because listen, the, the Empire of Japan was a male-dominated rule, in which the female was subjugated to the male. You know what I mean? Yeah. So if you have this male rulership now right. established as the mm-hmm. norm, you can't re- you can't tell the history that the nation of Japan originated by a witch that used black magic on the public, including all the male kings. That is not going yeah, to uh, uh, be in harmony yeah, with not, your new country. Yeah, that's not really something like they would proud be about, right? Like, like and Shan also the fact that and also ruling the country also by black about, magic. Yeah. And also uh, one thing about um, about uh, female shamanism is that even though they don't mesh as often, but you also have um, I would say um, sexually encounters between uh, the servant, the female servants of the female shaman, mm-hmm. and some of those uh, partners or lovers will also get a higher position in the cult. Such things happen also. So when you reconstruct this, going back to when the time Nippon was established as an empire, yeah. if you had to tell the public, listen, our nation, Nihon, actually, before it was known Yamato, Yamato was established as a confederacy under this witch, we became a high priestess, and she had um, female servants, who were, which were her lovers, had high positions throughout the country. Hmm. Well, how will this make the men look? It will make the men look horrible. And if you have a male-dominated True. rule, you want the men to look as the, the source of stability. So you cannot exactly. mention Himiko, hmm. but you cannot deny her also. So you have to include her one way. So there are two, there, there, so that's why as I mentioned before, they took the history of the Waki, uh, not of the kingdom around Nara, and made that the norm, as if that was all of Japan. Even though they admitted that Emperor Keiko tried to take over Kyushu, so they admit even in that narrative that not all of Japan was under the Nara regime. You get me? So you take that kingdom that was around Nara, call all, all the chieftains or kingdoms emperor, and you leave us black spots where things are too embarrassing. And when it comes to Himiko, you take either one of her um, lovers, because it can be, again, I can't prove this, but it can be that uh, the wife of one of the kings that passed away eventually uh, joined Himiko's court, and she had still had a high position, mm-hmm. and that was Jingu. So it can be that what we call Jingu was actually, uh, a woman was actually the wife, uh, 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 a queen consort that actually 
part, mm. being part of Himiko's okay. uh, household and for a time she mm. was actually dominating that little kingdom in Nara. Yeah. That can be a, a thing. But it can also be that this wife never existed, that they actually used this this fictive wife to describe what Himiko did. Yes. And think about this. Himiko died in 248. The reign of this so-called uh, Jingu Empress went to 269. Right. That's over 20 years. Mm. Okay. So those really, 20 years, really close, which is though. a generation. Yeah. Yes. But for us, it's a long time, 20 years. But when you look at it historically, it's, it's, a, it's a very short period. According to Chinese sources, after mm. uh, Himiko passed away, there was a man that tried to take over this, uh, this position, but nobody wanted to, nobody accepted it. Well, I would say as an anthropologist, duh, of course nobody's going to take it. If for, mm. Himiko ruled for, how many, for a few decades, if for a few decades, yet women um, being the main force in the economy, and now you have a man coming up playing, uh, trying to subjugate the females, and the public is not going to have it. Absolutely not. Yeah, she ran so almost for 60 years. Then, mm. according, so according to the Chinese sources, Io, uh, a, 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 which some say was a relative of her, some even claim it was a niece of her, who was 13 years old, became the new yeah. uh, uh, shaman queen or the sun empress. And everybody, and, and everyone was happy again. Yes, yeah, so we don't know much about Io, what she did, because we mentioned much about her. But but Io, think about that name. Or you say Io in Japan, how do you pronounce it? Io sounds the same as Io of ancient Greek. Greek. And Io they all, like, and they all, uh, yeah. refers to the sun god Apollo. But they do, and like, remember, yeah. Amaterasu, uh, Himiko, they also refer mm -hmm. to like the sun. So Yes. And it, and here's the thing. Um one thing that some uh, witches do, and when you have knowledge of paganism, uh you you know about this, some witches mm. have a special charmed mirror. With charmed I mean they energize in a negative way, uh, on a psychic level. Mm -hmm. They have this charmed mirror they walk with and with that mirror they can communicate with evil spirits to have guidance. So, they say that, at least this is the legend uh, that they say about, uh, about Japan, is that Amaterasu had this mirror shaped like uh, the, uh, with, with, kind of in a sun shape that she carried with her. Hmm. And that this became the uh, seal of Japan later on. And you still can see it on Japan. Uh, it's a golden seal. Yeah. Now, think about Himiko. She became rich, filthy rich. Okay. And she, as the head of all the paganism there in the island region, what would it be surprised that she had like a silver or golden mirror that she used to communicate with with, with the, the other entities she was worshipping? Probably. So, yeah. But even there you can see that um, Himiko cannot be forgotten in Japanese history. Because the nation, uh, the, the development of the nation of Japan Originated with her, you get know I me. Mean? So the later rulers decided we are going to vaguely mention her, and we're going to pretend like the title emperor or tenno was used going all the way back uh, to around the set, to hundreds of years, so that we can have a perceived legitimacy. Mm. You know what I mean? And that's what I want you to understand: perceived legitimacy. So sociologists and anthropologists understand the following: for the population. To get along with something, they must perceive that they get along with as legitimate. Let me give an example. In the year 1800, uh, Spain Spain did not exist as Spain was also like two unions, uh, um, Castile, El Leon, and Aragon working together. That the culture of Spain. Spain was a label they used for the outside world. And then the Union of Castile also had kingdoms in America. So it was the Spanish Empire, including the Philippines. Mm, also yes, okay. If you would be if you would be in Mexico City in the year 1800, you would see the flag of the Spanish flag everywhere. You know what I mean? You would have people uh, speaking Spanish the way they did in Europe and all that. Why? Because it was the Spanish Empire. You know what I mean? You see, you see yeah, we have coins with uh, with uh, yes. King uh, Carlos the Fourth on it. Or, 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 or obviously, it's part of Spain. Today. Yeah. Yes. So if you go now to Mexico City. You see a, the Mexican flag and all that. 
if you go now and put this flag of Spain over there, people think, whoa, 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 what goes on here? Let me tell you what happens. 1800, Mexico City was an international hub for trade because the Philippines was another Spanish kingdom that ex extracted um, goods from the Chinese Empire and other parts of Asia, even indirectly from Japan because Japan had a close uh, policy back then. Yeah. They went all the way to Acapulco, Acapulco to Mexico City, Mexico City to Veracruz, and Veracruz to La Habana, Cuba, to Spain. So Mexico City was quite important to the Spanish Empire. When the Spanish Empire crashed around um, um, the 1820s, eventually um, the old Spanish regime uh, was replaced with a Republican regime because the Mexican Empire, a short, that's something that lasts for like a year or two, it failed. So they established just a Mexican Republic. Mm -hmm. But nobody wanted a Mexican Republic, so they made it a Federal Republic. So since it looks similar to what they had under the Spanish Empire. And that's how they legitimized the, the nation called Mexico. Because Mexico used to be a small kingdom in North America. Besides, you had the kingdom of Yucatan, uh, Nueva Galicia, and all of that. And mm -hmm. later, they bought all of them together, except South America, and called it Mexico. So most in 1800, the term Mexican was barely used. All of those were Mexico City and the provinces around it. Now, yeah. Mexico is used for everyone, almost, from Yucatan all the way to... Uh, the Spanish, uh, the non, I mean, um, the Mexican uh, part of California. And remember, um, before the United States in 1848 took over the north mm. uh, uh, west of Mexico, Mexico went all the way uh, to what we call the western part of the United States. So understand this, the term Mexican became normalized over time. And the public had, had used to it, so they had to justify the Republic of Mexico saying, hey, hey, we are succeeding the Spanish Empire. Mm. Uh, we are so you kind of saying so it's perceived legitimacy. Now the perceived legitimacy of Mexico as an anthropologist and someone uh, who's a Latin Americanist, because I did Latin American studies also, mm -hmm. I can say the perceived legitimacy of Mexico is weak on one side and strong on the other. Weak on one side because in Mexico you still have this federal attitude that they want to remain locally autonomous, what you had under the Spanish uh, rule when the yeah. Spanish provinces in North America had direct contact with with the king. And they haven't around the late 18th century. But you also have uh, the drug cartels and also, also wanted to fight for legitimacy. So on mm -hmm. one hand, the perceived legitimacy of the regime called Mexico is weak. On the other hand, it's strong because people from there say, hey, we're, Mex we're from Mexico and Mexican, this Mexican culture. So on the cultural side, when it comes to uh, habits, music, and arts, the legitimacy of Mexico is, is strong. When it comes to the economy, it's a bit weaker. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I'll just use that as an example for you. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't talk about the Spanish Empire in Mexico now, but let's go back to um, yeah. J uh, Japan. Because we're already over. Think about perceived legitimacy. Yeah. So yeah. So we're already um, are over one hour. So I think let's make a uh, like a uh, sort end to it. So let's end with like mm -hmm. the uh, the Shinto uh, Shinto thing. There is like an Issei Jingu, uh, like. Do you know the Ise Jingu is, is, or the Ise Shrine? It's in Mia Prefecture and it's like, it's like the, probably the most, like, most important Shinto shrine in Japan because it's, uh, it's like, it's built to worship the deity Amaterasu. And like, the interesting thing with this is like, why is it called like, uh, like Ise, Ise? It's a Jingu. It's a, and why was Empress Jingu called in Jingu? Because Jingu also like uh, referred in, in in like modern Japanese days to shrines. But I was like I was surprised with the Ise Jingu, like the Amaterasu shrine in the prefecture. Yes. So yeah. And by the way, this shrine was built yeah. like uh what was it four, four in the in the year four I guess okay let's look up here. so mm. yes I, I heard about a shrine I also looked it up also and oh, four, understand four, the following four years before uh, like uh, like coming into uh, what was it called like common era or something? four BC or four four, four, four BC, the common era yeah BC. Common, yeah 
yeah, they say common error to avoid mentioning Christ, but okay. Mm. So yeah, you already had, as I mentioned before, religious sites throughout Japan and religious um, cults and all of that. Under Himiko, things uh, were uh, became sent around her. Okay, so that would mean that the existing shrines would have to be reformed into her. You know what I mean? She would she would become the new deity that they would worship as one who founded the nation. So the shrine can be older than uh, Himiko itself, absolutely. But over time, it became dedicated to worshiping her. But as I mentioned before, the later rulers who established Nippon will not explicitly mention a female ruler. So mm. they will generate this, uh, how do they say, this myth of a sun goddess and say we worship a sun goddess over here. And the myth of sun goddess will, will contain actual facts of Himiko's life. And that's how they keep the metaphor alive. Because this is how mythology often works. Not only are you hiding embarrassing or shocking things you can't justify, you also uh, codify history in a way that only initiates would know what actually happened. So that's something you see over here that Himiko's rule was codified as Amaterasu. And in that shrine, and probably other shrines in Japan too, she became the principal deity. And only those inaugurated fully into the religion will know this really what this means. Okay, good. So then I have a last question for you. Okay. Do you think that Emperor Jingu uh, was a real person or like a whole story was made up like mythology kind of thing, just like Amaterasu? And it was just well, for hiding about the story of Himiko. Well, what I get out of this, and I may be wrong, is that Jingu, whatever her real name was, mm. was likely a princess or a, the wife of one of, of the kingdom of, that was around Nara, and she was selected as a high-ranking priestess, and therefore also priest with political power in Himiko's uh, court, and that after Himiko passed away under Io, she still had a similar position. That is the best I can get out of this. Because, look, you can, people say, well, people just make up history. It's quite hard to fabricate history because if you fabricate history, you have to think about all the factors. It's going to look quite weird. So to make yeah. the Japanese history before Nippon look consistent, yes, they change some of the titles, all of that, but you cannot fully just invent someone out of the blue. Yeah, so Jingu, whoever she really was, was a real woman. She she was high-ranking uh, on the Himiko, late also on the Himiko successor, Iyo. Because and that's why most, they said her reign went to 269. Because most people would say, yeah, she was, she could probably be the same person or like the, uh, the same person as Himiko. But now you're mentioning, um, like she was like a warrior and Himiko, on the other hand, was a shaman priestess. So she, she didn't fight. Like, and, and like the Korean, there are Korean sources also like, like mentioning her. So, yeah, like saying that she was like the like the emperor thing yet yeah, doesn't make sense because there are too many there are too many uh like uh, years and days which are incorrect for like uh, like things that happened like some such as, like some sources would say she gave birth to Emperor Oji, but that's impossible because Emperor o Oji didn't exist during that time. Oh, so or or it was another child, you know. Uh, so I actually, yeah, I agree with you. Probably like the true ruler was killing Himiko at that period, and that Empress Jingu was on the like one of her like highest like servants, like in the, the in like in that those thousand women, right? Thousand women. Yes. And think about it also, Mrs. Shimizu. When uh, Himiko passed away, and later Iyo, her 13-year-old niece, took over, the, or niece or a relative, mm. she was only 13 years old. She would have to look up yeah, to an is. older female with more experience. Mm. And who would be more likely to look up to? One of the older servants of Himiko 
who has been loyal to her for a long time. Interesting. So that's how you can get this Jinku reign to 269. Exactly. And then, then but not that she was actually uh, empress, but she was mm. actually high-ranking uh, priestess. Mm. That would make a lot of sense and a lot of clearance, like in this whole early Asian Japan thing of rulers, especially female rulers. Which the modern the modern rulers of Japan didn't like well, talking about modern like medieval rulers didn't like because it was all men back then. Um so yeah, anyway, um I guess let's end this podcast for now because we're all over an hour. And I think it was it was pretty interesting. Uh thank you so much, uh, Mr. Dosset, for uh taking your time. Uh by the way, uh how how if people are interested, uh, how how could they reach you? Do you have like uh, like any platform where you're active? A- active R well, at the moment. I'm active on YouTube. R E Dosset, D O S S E double T. R E on my yeah. first no, letters. R E Dosset. I'm active there. No, no, no worries. I'll just put the link in the PDF. Yes. So. Yeah. And also, I'm also reachable on Instagram. I just use Instagram for fun and all that because I'm also a novelist for, for publishing novels also. I so Ari wow. does also on Instagram, you can find me. I think that I think that is sufficient. I don't really use social media that much, but I use um, I use uh, Instagram for just common context and also produce things on YouTube, spiritual about spiritual and historical subjects. So people can find me over there. Okay, yeah, great to hear. So, uh, yeah, once again, thank you very much for, for your time, Mr. Does it. Uh, you gave a lot of insights um, about, like, history in general, especially about, like, ancient Japan. Uh, so, like, people who are interested, uh, yeah, uh, I think you probably would have enjoyed this uh, talk, like, with me and Mr. Does it. Uh, so, yeah, anyway, uh, yeah, thank you very much for listening. Uh, so this is the end of the podcast. Uh, so once again, uh, I, I was your, I was your host, Shuzi Kevin, and once again, thank you, Mr. Dosset. Thank you too. Sayonara. <laughs>